Welcome to The Breakdown. My name is Umu. I'm a fellow on the Brickman Klein Center's Assembly Disinformation Program. I am recording today from California, and that is why my background doesn't appear the way it normally does, but I am excited nonetheless to be joined by Lisa Kaplan of the Aletheia Group. Um, Lisa founded the Aletheia Group to help organizations navigate the new digital reality and protect themselves against disinformation. Thank you for joining us, uh, Lisa. I'm so excited to have a conversation with you about this and many, many other pertinent, pertinent issues. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Yes. So our uh, conversation today centers on a really, really big topic in the disinformation space, and that is the shift in focus um, among a bunch of different stakeholder groups, including the national security community, academics, civil society, and others. Um, and focusing on disinformation from a national security sort of foreign policy geopolitics perspective. So Alicia, the first, uh, the first thing I want to ask you to that end is uh, just can you give us a little bit of a taste of your background and what sort of compelled you to, to found the Aletheia Group? Um, I started the Aletheia Group in 2019. And prior to that, I was the digital director on a 2018 Senate campaign. One of the things about disinformation that I always like to remind people is it's not always a foreign government and it's not always people who are seeking necessarily geopolitical goals. Um, the goals for threat actors really do vary depending on the threat actor. And that's one of the reasons why the hard work of attribution that we do at Aletheia Group is so important. Um, but it, it does depend on who the actor is and what their motive is. And once you know that, you can infer what their goal may be, and it can help to mitigate a situation before it even starts, yeah. or it can be used to mitigate a situation that's elevated into more of a crisis situation. So I was working for Senator Angus King, and because he was running against a Democrat and a Republican, we were looking at disinformation narratives from both sides, not necessarily doing the work of attribution, um, but um, because, you know, we were a campaign, we had limited resources, um, but, you know, trying to understand what the narratives were that were out there. And um, what we realized is that disinformation, you know, it, it was targeting um, candidates, it was targeting issues, but at the end of the day, it's really targeting voters, us as people. Yeah. And when you think about it as in an election context, it's really straightforward. It's trying to influence um, people's decisions around when, where, and how, who to vote for. Um, you know, targeting those decision points. Um, are you going to vote? And then if so, who are you going to cast your ballot? However, disinformation, it's not an issue that's limited to just elections and especially for sophisticated actors. So think foreign adversaries, think um, for-profit disinformation networks who have built up influence to then sell to the highest bidder or um, are building up influence to be able to generate um, ad revenue through clicks, for example. They're not just talking about one election or one candidate. They're talking about a variety of different issues. Um, and so I say that because, um, you know, for us and the proliferation of this, um, these, the number of threat actors since 2016 has been exponential. What started as being primarily Russian, we now have, according to Oxford, over um, 80 countries who are actively engaging in social media manipulation. And that doesn't even account for all of the individuals who have stood up their own operations. Um, you know, we also see on both sides of the aisle, to be clear, um, political consultants engaging in similar behaviors as, and social media manipulation tactics. So it really comes down to who is the actor and what is the goal. Now, fast forward. Um, one of the things that we saw, unfortunately, and it's very unfortunate that it took um, essentially an insurrection attempt at the US Capitol to really catapult this conversation. And there are a variety of research organizations, including ours, that had been um, beating this drum for several years now. And so people were saying, oh, it's it's just a meme, but no, it can really, you know, disinformation really can lead to offline harms. And we know that. We've seen that with Pizzagate. We've seen that with, um, you know, different different events such as um, the LA Dodgers stadium being shut oh, down. Oh, yes. Coronavirus vaccine site, right? So we are seeing more and more offline action happening as a result of um, disinformation. Um, I think one of the things about the what happened at the U.S. Capitol um, is it's a really important case study. And I say that 
And I know it sounds clinical, but um, because what happened was obviously a horrible day for our democracy and I think affected the research community in a variety of different ways. So that was a very tough month for everyone. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to sound overly clinical about it, but in a lot of ways, there are a lot of lessons that can be learned. Um, so for example, we can draw a straight line from some of the narratives that were happening in March saying that the election would be rigged, that there would be political violence, that people needed to start preparing for the worst to what happened on January 6th. One of the good things to come out of January 6th though is that most people get a second chance. Not everybody, obviously there's um, a Capitol police officer who died in the line of duty protecting the Capitol, um, but we're able to really learn from this moment and move forward so that we're addressing this threat in a way that does make it so that we're able to identify these online threats and prevent them from becoming offline harms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for that um, summation of, uh, of what not only what happened on January 6th, but actually like the, the through line you can draw between the sort of initial stop the steal uh, narratives and organizing to what ended up happening on the 6th and what I think is also projected to sort of continue um, this week on the 4th. Can you talk a little bit about your practice at Aletheia Group and how you help organizations navigate through this new digital environment? At Aletheia Group, what we do is we detect instances of disinformation, misinformation, and social media manipulation, as well as track other types of online harm, such as targeted harassment, to be able to help individuals figure out how to how to navigate this new digital reality. Um, I think that a lot of times people don't realize how many options they actually have. So for example, if you're able to detect, a, what, what a lot of people are doing right now is they're analyzing something once it's already gotten onto Twitter, onto Facebook, onto YouTube, for example, and it's on one of these mainstream platforms and they call the social media platforms and they say, please take it down. Yeah. That's one option. But if you've gotten to that point in a lot of ways, it may already be too late. So what we do is we practice early detection. So we try to, we catch narratives when they start and we're able to then track them and understand how they may be influencing individuals um, and seeking to change individuals' behavior. We analyze on the network level. And what that does is it enables us to take more options. So for example, Let's take these um, for-profit disinformation networks. Well, um, you know, if they're making a profit off of um, a potential organization, there could be an opportunity to seek damages. If they're misappropriating intellectual property, such as your name, your likeness, um, trademarkable or patentable or copyrighted material, um, there are legal options that organizations can take to seek recourse. Um, if there is um, an opportunity to do counter messaging, and I'm not talking about fact checking in our experience, fact checking while it's helpful in creating a paper of record or it's helpful in giving something to point to to set the story straight, it's not sufficient. And here's why. The people who are choosing to believe a narrative aren't necessarily going to believe something, you know, salacious about it. It's, change their mind and say they no longer believe something that's totally salacious um, about you and confirms their biases about you just because you're the one that said it isn't true. Um, so we're talking about really counter narrative building. Um, you know, and that can be done in an ethical way um, by creating um, a greater understanding around an individual or an organization. So um, what we do is we help through the entire process. So we detect what's happening. We assess whether or not it's having an impact on an organization's goal. And then we help to mitigate any potential impacts. The idea being that we can solve a lot of problems before they become a real issue or a challenge for an organization. You know, along with the, the expansion of the threat landscape, um, there has been sort of an uptick in sustained um, information events um, like the COVID pandemic, like Stop the Steal, and just a lot of the, not just disinformation, but chatter around the election. Are there other um, structural developments or other factors that you attribute to the, this expansion of the threat landscape and the shift that, you know, the shift in focus from foreign disinformation to domestic? Yeah, I think one of the things about disinformation and, you know, there was conversation around how this was going to happen after 2016, because yeah. it's fast, cheap and easy to do. If you know how to run a good marketing campaign, 
you can probably figure out how to run a disinformation campaign. Um, and so with that, and then you also look historically, um, open source estimates say that the Russian inter, um, attempt to influence the 2016 election cost a million dollars, which is a rounding error to most large organizations or federal governments. Right. So it wasn't a question of if other organizations were going to start engaging in these tactics. It was a question of when. Um, and I think what we've seen is the proliferation of that. Um, it's the proliferation of um, the number of threat actors that's causing an increased number of threats um, when it comes to the disinformation landscape. So going to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, and these narratives have shifted over time um, and they vary again based on the threat actor. So one thing we saw, and again, this is all open source, just Russian state media. Um, you know, we did see Russian state media pushing race narratives, um, targeting different communities and trying to pit them against each other. We saw um, RT put out content that was more focused on, um, you know, what's the big deal with calling it the China virus, for example. We called it the Spanish flu. Um, and RT typically targets one audience. And then we saw the now, which is, um, you know, typically targeting younger audiences um, on Instagram with videos being like, if you are Asian, you will get attacked in New York City. And it's not to say that people haven't experienced those sort of attacks. Um, and, you know, as a result of disinformation, going back to the online to offline action, and I don't want to make it sound like it's just the Russian government, because there are definitely other actors who are playing in this space. Um, but it, it is, I think, just providing more opportunities um, from that perspective. And then, you know, similarly, there's the, the financial motivations and the financial perspective. So we'll see um, some of these junk domains pushing false information about the pandemic. Um, and they're doing so because likely to generate a profit. Um, you know, they have... Um, advertising revenue that they're getting um, from clicks. So I think it really does depend on who the, the actor is as to why they're pushing it. But because it's so cheap, easy, and potentially lucrative to do, as well as it works um, from a geopolitical perspective. Um, so, and if it's cheap, why not try? There's not really a high cost um, to people who are executing these sorts of campaigns. Not at all. And um, I would just echo what you said by, you know, by pointing out that it's been so interesting that since 2016, um, you know, our own elected leaders see value in exploiting the sort of fissures in society that we have and exploiting them for their own political gain. As you mentioned, you know, this happens both, um, both on the right and on the left. Um, I want to shift gears and talk about some of the specific mitigations. So one of the most significant um, impediments to legislating on disinformation and engaging it, um, engaging on it from a policy or regulatory perspective is that moderation um, is often criticized as being a brush up um, against the First Amendment. Um, what is your thinking around how regulation can encourage effective moderation without brushing up against those First Amendment concerns and then I guess also more broadly, what is your thinking around what the government's role should be in addressing specifically uh, domestic disinformation? Well, I do appreciate and admire a lot of um, our colleagues in this space who are putting out really important research that can inform eventual legislation, um, where I see the opportunity for more immediate action um, is actually um, through other, other means such as um, you know, the, our judicial system and so on and so forth and forth. And I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Um, when it comes to um, First Amendment, so that's an argument that I just don't really buy. Um, we accept limits to speech in real life. I can't yell fire in a movie theater. Like there will be consequences for me. We've accepted that there are some limits on speech. And yeah. so I think we should be reframing this question to say, how can we make the online conversation more reflective of the conversations that we have offline. I think one of the things that's become really clear in the pandemic when we've all been, um, you know, forced inside and online to a degree is um, that that's not where we're at right now, but there's no reason why that's not where we can be. I think what we need to be talking about too, though, is, um, you know, um, when it comes to content moderation, um, 
I don't think that that necessarily removes the threat altogether. For example, we saw a lot of um, accounts be deplatformed um, for um, breaking the terms of service multiple times. And again, I think that's a perfectly acceptable consequences. It's kind of mm -hmm. like the no shirt, no shoes, no service version of social media platforms. It's like, if you break the rules on multiple occasions, you're not going to be allowed back in. Um, the, but where I think we need to be headed um, and where I think we're going to see the most um, progress in the immediate is enforcing some of the laws that are already on the books. Um, so for example, the Dominion lawsuit that's ongoing right now is something that I'm paying attention to. Um, yep. I think that that is um, a potential avenue. We've also seen um, some successes when it comes to copyright infringements because um, bad guys aren't really paying attention to following the laws if they're spinning up disinformation campaigns. So I think that we can potentially anticipate um, some actions taken there. Um, you know, I think that the, the other thing that has been interesting to watch unfold is um, the stop hate for profit sort of activism. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is potentially having an impact as well. Um, so all that said, I, I don't see this as a speech only issue. I think that there are very serious concerns, especially when we're thinking about the world outside of the United States and a, the Western liberal order, where yeah. um, you know sometimes social media is how you evade censorship. And so these are really tough challenges and there are no easy solutions. And I think having these conversations and debates are hugely important because if this were an easy fix, it would be solved by now. So, um, I but I am confident that this is something that we will we will begin to see, and we've seen progress since 2016. To be fair, but we will be, continue to see progress. We will continue to see solutions um, proposed and implemented. You had mentioned earlier that um, you've observed that fact checking is not necessarily the most effective way to to clamp down on some of the. The bad and false information we see circulating online and certainly not enough to sort of interrupt the cementing of alternate realities um, that really disinformation is intended to foster. Yeah, so I think that fact checking definitely plays a role, but I don't think it's something that can be done alone. Um, I think, you know, labeling that sort of thing. Um, it, these are relatively new, um, new features. And so, you know, what, how effective they are, um, that's a little bit outside of my purview. And I look forward to reading somebody's research someday that did a longitudinal study on how effective um, labels were on any given social media user. Um, but I do think we need to start thinking about this challenge more holistically than we currently are, right? Um, so for example, it's not just what's happening on social media platforms, it's also what's happening on blogs. It's how um, social, some of these disinformation networks are being financed. It's through advertising revenue. It's through, um, it's through um, frankly, like people who are building influence and then turning around and selling it for profit. Those are all things that, um, you know, I think we can incorporate into part of the solution when we're trying to figure out how do we put out the fire that's happening right now. I think when we look towards long term solutions to figure out, um, you know, what is it that we can do to really change the equation to make it so that disinformation is um, not as successful as it is now. There's all kinds of things we can do, but I keep coming back to education. Yeah. If every single person knew what we knew and likely what everybody who listens to these podcasts um, knew, we'd be in a lot better shape. Um, so how do we make it so that we're not so special anymore? How do we make it so that the general population is more resilient to disinformation? And a lot of that has to do with education. Um, so when I was in high school, we used to do these things where we would basically learn how to read a news article. We would learn how to read um, a newspaper based on, you know, what page was the article on in the newspaper for relative importance? What paper right. were we reading? Like, who's the author? When was the paper published? Like, how do you read the first two paragraphs? How do you read for bias? why aren't we teaching that for a digitized world? Because I am still pretty old school and I like physical newspapers, so I get them, but I'm like the rarest subscriber you will see for my age demographic. Like one of the things we need to consider is how do we 
modernize our approach to consuming media. And I don't want to put it on the social media user to protect themselves from a sophisticated information operation. But again, when you think about it as a holistic solution, this can also be a piece of the puzzle that really makes a difference. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me.